So I took a break and then I came back with fresh ears and fresh mind and I did a little bit more tweaking. I went back and I looked at all the choices I'd made up until this point and I fixed and kind of bumped things around a little bit more. And I'm a little bit happier with how, how things are sounding now. And now I'm ready to move into the final dimension, the dimension of depth. That is controlling how close does a sound appear to be or how far does a sound appear to be. And the way that I accomplish this is through balancing the dry, unprocessed version of a sound against the, the wet or the processed version of a sound through reverb. So reverb in its initial intention is designed or for the purposes of mimicking the sense of space or the way that a sound would interact with a space. You could think of this as being the difference between you singing in a coat closet or you singing in a cathedral, that your voice would sound very different in those two spaces, or your voice would activate those two spaces, or those spaces would respond differently to your voice. So the way we accomplish reverb inside of the box, um, I mean, we could take a speaker and play this into a real space, um, which I would strongly recommend you experiment with, but what, the way we do this inside of the box is through returns and reverb effects. So let's first talk about return tracks before we bring reverb in here. So let's collapse down the browser for now. So to create a return track inside of Ableton, I right click and go to insert return track or the shortcut command option T. You'll see that as soon as I've created that, it not only creates a new track over here next to the master track, but it also creates these send knobs or send dials on all of the local or all the instruments or audio tracks, even the ones that are inside of my group tracks. And what these dials then represent is how much of the signal that is passing through this tracks mix mixer is also sent or copied and sent to the return track associated with that dial. So this is return track A's send dial, and here we see return A over here. In other digital audio workstations, we'll see these set up as aux tracks and buses. Um, so if you're working in another digital audio workstation, look up how to use aux tracks and buses. So now uh, if we crack this open and experiment a little bit, we can see that if I solo out this rim sound, jump to a section where it's actually happening, get it playing, that I can use this send dial to start to increase the amount of signal that's being sent to that return track. A little quiet for me, that's a little bit better. Um, so now we've got two copies of the signal arriving at the master track. We have what's coming from this rim track itself, which passes out to the group track, which then passes along to the master. Then we also have a copy being sent to this return track, which then passes through any effects that might be on there. In this case, there's no effects on there. And then it passes along to the master track. So currently all we've done is made that rim sound twice as loud by routing it two copies to that master track. So now there's two stages at which this send knob can be connected or plugged into or inserted into the signal flow of this rim track. The first stage and the default stage so we see just above the master track here is post fader, meaning that if I come over here and I decrease the volume on the local track, you'll see that actually the volume that's being sent to the return track is also decreased. Also, if I pan this signal at all, you can see that that panning takes effect on both tracks. Now I can switch this behavior or go to the secondary behavior for this dial, and that is to click over here and switch it into pre. Now what this means is that I can turn down the volume on this track, I can pan it all I want to, and you'll see that we're still receiving whatever amount of signal I've portioned with this dial here. So now it's in a sense grabbing it before the sound has been processed by this track's mixer. And this is actually the, the um, uh, setup that I like to use when mixing. If I was doing something live, I prefer to keep everything in post. That way, if I turn down the volume on a sound, it's turned down regardless of where it's being sent to. So now that we've got a little bit better understanding of return tracks, let's use them to um, add a sense of space to this track. I'm going to go to my browser, audio effects, reverb, drag and drop that reverb onto a track. 
Now, often, as we saw in uh, the prepping for mix videos of this series, we saw that a lot of instruments and a lot of presets come bundled with or already have some reverb applied to them. And that's definitely something that you want to go back and pull out. Um, we do this for two reasons. The first reason is um, the most important, and that is um, reverb is creating a sense of space around that sound. And if we have several different types of spaces and all of our instruments in different types of spaces, our track can lose its cohesiveness. This could be the equivalent of if you were recording a band and you had the singer sing in the bottom of a dried out swimming pool, you had the drummer record inside of a uh, middle school gymnasium, you had uh, uh, the tambourine player play in the coat closet and so on and so forth. And then you tried to bring all of those together as a finished track. Everything in that track would sound like they were separate elements and it wasn't intended to go together. Or at least we would be really drawn or our ears would be drawn to the fact that all these sounds, there's something weird about how these sounds are going together that doesn't feel natural. Um, so we much more expect that when we listen to music, it sounds like one band that was playing or one group of instruments that were all playing in the same space. And that's the expectation. We can always break expectations, but at least that's what the listener is expecting from our music. So by going through and removing all of those um, reverb instances from all of our instruments or all of our tracks, and putting that reverb on one return track, that gives us a really easy way of saying we're only working with a single space and all of my sounds are then controlled or positioned as being either near or far from me inside of that single space. The second reason, which is as technology improves, getting less and less uh, of a concern is the CPU usage of how much processing power does my computer need to generate these tracks. That um, if I have reverb and tons of reverb on every single one of the tracks within my project, it's going to be a lot more CPU intensive than if I just route using sends and return tracks all of my tracks through one reverb view. Um, so while that's kind of a, a declining issue, it's still something to be thinking about, especially for those of you on less powerful machines. You might be struggling because you've got all those reverbs on all of your individual tracks. So I'm not going to talk too much about... Um, the uh, kind of inner workings of reverb. We can go to the presets here by clicking on the hot swap button and see all the available types of sounds that are built in with our, uh, with, with Ableton's reverb effect to get a different type of sound going if I wanted to. But the biggest thing um, that we need to look for right off the bat is the dry wet knob. Because as we had already seen before we put any reverb effect on this track, as soon as I start to increase this send, if there's nothing processing that signal, all I'm doing is doing is increasing the volume of that sound that I'm sending that return track by doubling the amount of signal or that copies of that signal that's arriving at that master track. So the first thing I need to do with any reverb that I load up onto a return track is ensure that by the time the signal leaves this track to go to the master track, we only have the wet or the processed uh, versions of those sounds being passed along to the master track. That way, arriving at the master track, we have coming from the local track, the dry signal, and from the return track, the processed or the wet signal. So that's the one thing that we need to look for when setting up some reverb, is ensuring that uh, everything is completely wet or only the processed signal by the time we get to the other end. One other thing that I'll point out about Ableton's reverb here is this quality uh, drop down here in the middle that I always like to take down up to the high, especially for mastering, I'm sorry, for mixing, um, just because I think the eco one sounds pretty terrible and the high sounds reasonably good. Um, great, so now we can start to mess around with this balance. So as I said at the start of this video, uh, the way we position or suggest how near or how far a sound is from us is through uh, the balance between the unprocessed versus the processed version or the unreverberated versus the reverberated version of that signal. So I like to do this through switching my sends to pre stage. Again, if I was performing, I'd leave it in post, but because I'm mixing, I'm going to switch it over to pre. And now that gives me separate control over how much is being sent to the reverb versus the now the track style is really 
um, how much of the dry is being sent to the master channel. So I really have two kind of mixers here for this. So I can start with, here's my unreverberated sound. Turn it up a little bit louder. Then I can start to add reverb to that. And now when we're right here at kind of a perfect balance between dry and wet, we've taken the sound from being something right around here, which is up close and intimate. Now it starts to recede back into the space, but not too far. Now I would say it's about halfway back in this space. And as I start to bring down the dry signal, that rim sound gets further and further away till it's nearly at the back of the room. And as I start to bring down the wet signal, having no dry signal whatsoever, the sound recedes back into space. So again, that process was starting at fully dry, we have an up close and intimate sound. As I start to add in reverb, that sound starts to pull back from the listener, moving back into the space and we get a stronger sense of the space or the room that that sound is within. And as I start to decrease the, the dry signal, that sound pulls even further back into the room. And then once we're fully wet, there is no dry signal arriving at the output. And I start to decrease the overall dry or wet signal that sound moves even further and further away from us. So that slow kind of crossfade from dry to 50-50 to fully wet um, and then decreasing that fully wet signal is giving us that sense of movement back and forth within the space. So now I'm going to go through each of the elements of this track and position them within the sense of space, keeping in mind that um, by suggesting how close or how far something is from the listener, I'm ranking that in terms of hierarchy of saying something that's up close and personal is something you should pay attention to and something that's further back is something that should be a little bit less um, of the focus or neglected. But again, all of this is expectation and we can play with those expectations. Um, so what does it mean if I take the vocalist of a track and I have them way at the back of the room? How does that change the relationship uh, that the listener has to the music. Are they longing for that vocalist to come back to the front of the room? Or are they happy there at the back of the room? What's What does that suggest about the music? So all of this, while it's mostly or partially craft, it's still also artistry of how are we using these tools or this workflow to emote or create music. So let's uh, let's get into this and start positioning some of these sounds. So let's start with the kick drum. So like the uh, panorama and the difference between how high frequencies and low frequencies are responding to space, I find that the same is true with reverb, that with low frequencies, I tend to want to keep those out of the reverb because I find that they really muddy things up. So if I were to put too much of this kick in there, now there's already a lot of space that's being occupied and I wouldn't be able to put too much into a track that had a kick drum with so much reverb on it. So I'll usually back that out. And maybe just give it a little sense of space. So not much, just the point where we can hear that top end kicking in there. Then let's bring in the uh, rim sound. snare sound add in the clap I think I'll put these pretty far back and 
notice how this is changing my volumes quite a bit. All right, so there's my drums there. If I turn off or mute out the reverb, there's my unreverberated where there's little sense of depth. And then all of a sudden that opens up. All right, let's add in, uh, let's do the guitar next. This is gonna be my focus of the track, so I wanna keep this up close. Let's actually, let's play with that sense of space and let's bring in a second reverb. So create a new turn, return track, command option T. Call this one my small verb. Call this one my big verb. And let's stick on there a hall. Let's go. Uh, let's do cathedral just for that really some big sense of space. So check to make sure it's fully wet, which it already is. And then let's have that pad sound, which is already in the small one. Let's also add it into the big one. Sounds good. And let's do the same thing with this Super JP, add in a little bit more of that bigger on there. Nice. And now how's this sounding as a total package? Let's see, let's go back to the chord start here. Oh, we totally forgot about the brass. Let's go do that. Let's see, here's where they're happening. All right, so that's sounding good. I think it's the same thing where I've got to sit here and I've got to tweak for a while to really get things just right. Maybe try out some different reverbs for both my big and my small there. But at least, uh, or hopefully you're getting the idea here, the concept here of how we're controlling how sounds can be either up close and intimate or far back and distant. So uh, once we're done with this, we're nearly there.